it was an embarrassment. It was a dirty little secret. Antonia Johnston, founder and CEO of Sign of the Times, a luxury pre-owned marketplace pioneering the authentication and valuation of designer goods. Don't tell my friends I'm here. Like, don't tell them I bought this. We are one of the largest independent UK luxury resellers uh, mm. now. So it's been a really fun, very circular journey, actually. What do you wish you'd known sooner? Throw tennis balls before you throw cannonballs. <laughs> so try small stuff, small stuff, test, test, test. And then when you find something that works, go big. If you're not failing at 50% of your goals, you're not setting high enough goals. That is how I run my business. How do you balance the need for profitability and for growing your business with the focus on sustainability. Mm. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. You did it. You got the show to 1,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular and you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. Let's get to 2,000 subscribers. And I promise you, I'll get even more amazing guests. Let's do it. Antonia. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you for having me. Very really? exciting to be here. I have to be honest, I haven't heard of Sign of the Times okay. before. Mm -hmm. So we'd love to hear from you what your business is. Yeah, absolutely. So we're a pre-loved luxury marketplace. Uh, as far as I can tell, we're the original luxury reseller. So the business was first started in 1976. Um, we are now um, online and we have a single flagship store in Chelsea. And we work with both high net worth individuals as well as businesses to extend the life cycle of luxury goods. Amazing. So 1976. Six. Wow, that's really, like really goes back a long time, huh? <laughs> yeah, it goes back a long way. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's an incredibly famous business. It's very notorious in the fashion space. So um, we've got clients that actually span three generations. So uh, potentially their mother was stomping across the King's Road, down the King's Road when they were younger, and now uh, their daughter and then their granddaughter are still shopping with us. So it's really exciting. Oh, amazing. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that you get really, really vintage pieces as a result? Old. We don't actually do any vintage at all, really. We do some uh, Chanel and Hermes, but mostly we're either current season or up to two seasons old. Right. Uh, so yes, we are not a vintage reseller. Mm. No, that's super interesting. Obviously, in the last even five years, COVID, there's been such a focus on, well, both on sustainability in fashion, yeah. as well as making the most out of your wardrobe and monetizing your wardrobe mm -hmm. and not having to, you know, continuously spend more money on fast fashion or even on new products. What's your take on sustainability or why is sustainability so important to you? I am very proud to work in a business that both fulfills that kind of urge for the new, for the exciting, to feel good in what you're wearing, I think is a real human nature, um, but actually to be to fulfill that in a sustainable way is really exciting for us. Um, so 65% of pre-owned purchases do actually offset a new purchase. And just by extending the life cycle of a single item, you're reducing its impact by 30 to 40%. So it's hugely impactful what we're doing in secondhand. I think for me also beyond just the sustainability part, it's also the human element. Um, there's still 45 million people in the world and modern slavery and actually 58% of that according to global global slavery index are, are found in the garment making and cotton picking industries of the world so fashion has a huge impact both both environmentally and also uh, on our fellow humans so mm. to kind of be able to um, still indulge in that incredible feeling when you wear a new item and you know it does make you walk a little taller but to be able to offer for that in a very sustainable way is, is very exciting for me. Mm. And going back to talking about, you know, the business having yep. been around since 1976, how how did you get involved with this? Like how, like yeah. clearly you haven't been around since then, let me tell you yeah, that. I've got a good doctor. No. <laughs> um, yes, you're right. So um, it's actually a very interesting story. So um, 
I did economics at university and at the bottom of my road, there was a really tiny, dirty, little dingy secondhand store. It used to sell secondhand top shops, secondhand warehouse. Uh, I thought it was incredible. I uh, used to go in and buy items for 10 pounds, you know, when you're a student, it's amazing. And I took my mom one day and was just so excited to show her and she just thought it was the worst thing ever <laughs> and I just couldn't understand why but then over time I was thinking about it and I thought oh yes there's nothing nothing here for my mother and nothing here for women of that age that actually they would spend quite a lot of money and they still want a luxury item but um so I kind of left uni thinking uh how can I solve that problem and how can I offer a a sustainable luxury item for less without impacting on the experience. Uh, So all of my friends that did economics went off into very high flying, very well-paid jobs. And I went to go and get work experience at Sign of the Times. Um, And that was the best pre-owned store in London at the time. And I worked there for four months on the prerequisite that I would go off and set up my own company, but it couldn't be in London. Um, So set up, uh, so worked there for four months, then left to go and set up my own pre-owned business. That went really well. And we grew that to a a second location. That went really well. And then I picked up the phone to the lady that owned Sign of the Times and said, would you be interested in me acquiring your business? And she said, yes. So in 2019, I acquired Sign of the Times and I merged the businesses together. Um, And then since then, we've also gone on to acquire another pre-owned business. So uh, we are one of the largest independent UK luxury resellers sellers uh, Mm. now so it's been a really fun very circular journey actually Mm, that's interesting you went to work for four months you had this idea that you wanted to get experience with a view to setting something up and you went ahead and did that made it so successful that you went back and acquired the business that taught you how to do it in the first place I mean that's incredible that's an incredible story thank you how did you feel at the time when you called up the lady who owns it and said, I want to buy you? Um, Kind of disbelief that she would be open to it, um, mixed with a tinge of huge excitement. And to be honest, I consider it a real honor to own Sign of the Times. It's incredibly famous and... um, I just consider that I'm kind of looking after it really for the next <laughs> for the next generation. You said that you've acquired another business. Mm-hmm. What is that? Uh, there was one called Kidoni. Mm-hmm. Um, Kidoni was um, one of our largest competitors. And unfortunately, you know, it's been a really tough economic climate and uh, the raising um, landscape was very difficult and they didn't manage to secure their next raise. Uh, so we did actually acquire their assets earlier in the year. This episode is sponsored by HVO Search, especially specialist executive search and talent advisory firm helping founders, CEOs and HR directors hire the most in-demand and best C-suite talent. Tired of seeing the same old CVs and uninspiring candidates? Reach out to me, Maria Borostovsky, to find out how your business can skyrocket with the best talent. How you are different to your competitors. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. So I would say firstly, our kind of longevity and the time in the market. So we've got, there's a lot of uh, competitors kind of coming out now, I would say. People often think it's quite an easy (laughs) business to get into until they get into it. And then they realize it's incredibly operational, logistical, and actually to scale it is a very complex, uh, it's a very complex business. So Mm -hmm. I would say certainly, yes, our our time and um, in the market. Secondly, I always think my team, I've got an absolutely exceptional team, ex Netta Porter, ex Outnet, ex The Real Real, ex um, Exclusive Farfetch. And um, we really have that kind of knowledge of pre-owned in the market. Um, And then from a customer perspective, we offer on-model photography, we offer video. We are trying to offer that as new experience. Um, So we offer same day delivery, same day home collection. um, And we offer in, we also have um, an omni-channel experience so you can come in uh, try on items and uh, we offer personal styling and and try and kind of is, is yeah essentially offer an as new shopping experience but in pre-owned 
We also support business, um, so regular retail with their resale initiatives as well. Uh, so, for example, we've just raised recent investment from Brand Alley, and uh, we are going to be supporting them with their take back scheme. So we're going to be able to provide them with a white label resale service so that they can turn their business circular. Because one of the the, the main issues uh, with the, the circular economy is that regular retail has a very linear supply chain, and they just it's so complex to, to think about even changing that supply chain it's actually easier to get an external company in to kind of handle all of that supply and circularity for them Mm. no it's true i mean we've been talking about circular fashion or fashion sort of destroying the earth yeah because there's just always this demand for newness for consumption Mm -hmm. and the next thing and the next thing and the next trend Mm. and even though trends come back you know you (laughs) are constantly reminded of that, you know, there is there is something fresh and new somewhere like, you know, around yeah. the corner that, that you have to have that. Mm. How do you balance the need for profitability and for growing your business with the focus on sustainability? Mm. I think we are incredibly lucky in that the, na- the very nature of our business is that it is sustainable. Uh, so... I am very focused on kind of the health of the business. So yes, on profitability, which is actually very rare for a resale business um, and for a marketplace per se as well. Um, So I think we just, we do what we can. So we're very conscious that we have a store. So that's more sustainable than kind of, if someone wants to make that sustainable choice to come to the store and shop in store rather than just shopping online, then we offer that. We're conscious of the packaging that we use and just, I guess, also educating the client on, on how to make more sustainable choices in the way that they shop Mm. how do you educate the customer i think it's a lot through social media and then also we as i say um we have a whole team in our chelsea store and just to engage in conversation and to drive excitement for pre-owned i've got such a passion for it i shop pre-owned in every element of my life um within reason (laughs) um and you know it's just kind of conveying that excitement and not thinking of it as a second choice, but really making it a first choice for people and really engaging, like like you say, that kind of need for newness. I provide that every single, and I I personally don't, but my incredible marketing do provide that every single day on our social media. We drop very similarly to what you would consider the fast fashion companies to drop. So new product, new product, new product all the time, but without that kind of impact Mm. so i try and yeah i try and provide it um all of the excitement of a kind of fast fashion experience but without the footprint Mm. how has the perceptions of the resale products changed in the last five years do you think yeah i mean because i've been in it for some time i've got quite a few data points and actually can go back over 10 years uh so in my first ever resale business i used to have uh, women coming in and saying don't tell my friends i'm here like don't tell them I bought this don't tell them where I got this and then 10 minutes later their friend would be coming in telling me the same thing Mm. and actually it was it was an embarrassment it was a dirty little secret everyone was doing it but it was still very much undercover how long ago was this that was at least 10 years ago yeah um and now it seems to be the new thing but I mean for me obviously and um for the business it's been going on for years and years and years but Mm. now resale is almost so exciting so fresh so new um and people are proud to be pre-owned to Mm. be honest and and actually we have incredibly high profile clients choosing to buy from us for for really big occasions and they're very proud to say actually I bought this pre-owned from sign of the times um so it's it's exciting that, that that it's moving in that direction. So is it a bit like a stamp of approval? I think that it is. if it is from Sign of the Times, then that's the brand that you know knows what it's doing and the products are authentic and mm. you can trust. Yeah, I think so. Mm. I think also a stamp of approval in that you know there takes it takes a bit of creativity to actually be able to pick something yourself and to not just buy new. Um, you're kind of showing that you are sort of you know your fashion and you can you can really select and curate um which is quite a a trendy thing now Mm. no i totally get that you have to really know yourself your style and exactly what you're looking for with regards to authenticity Mm -hmm. in a world where potentially there are lots of counterfeit products like how do you ensure authenticity 
Yeah, for sure. So um, firstly, we work, we're very careful with the sellers that we work with, uh, many that we've worked with for many years. And if we have a new seller on, there is quite a few extra checks. Um, and then when it comes down to the garment level, we have um, thousands and thousands of products in stock that we can check against. Um, so for clothing, it's very much around the fabric, the finish, the tags, the um, all of those different things uh with the handbags again very similar um but we also go one step further with the handbags and we use a machine learning device um which actually authenticates at the microscopic level mm -hmm. so um you can take a photograph and it compares it against every other single item in the market that is known to be authentic at the microscopic level um and it can give you out i think it's 99.8 percent accuracy rating against that to say yes this is authentic or no, this isn't. Uh, so of course it's, you know, constant education, um, constantly looking uh, at each item very carefully. What are the most popular items? So we're talking about, is it shoes, is it handbags, is it jackets, dresses? What's the category that gets bought the most? Yeah, I think everyone's got their jam, haven't they? <laughs> it's true. So I want to know the What's data. Yours? I want to know the stats. <laughs> what mine, do you is, go for? <laughs> mine is probably, mine is probably handbags. Okay. Nice. Yeah. I don't even carry a handbag. You've got, you can see me arrive in my crappy rucksack because I'm always working. Right. But mm -hmm. Mine is probably shoes. Yeah. Um, but everyone's got their thing. Um, of course, handbags, they're the easiest seller, aren't they? Because they don't need to fit anybody. Um, so they're, that they, they of course are a very good category, but we are also most well known for our clothing. We have absolutely exceptional clothing. And I think it's one of those things that if you think about something like a Chanel classic flap, you always think, oh, that's a great investment. But actually for me, one of my best investments has been my Maximara coat because I wear that day in day out in the winter and it's super chic and it's it's kind of produced year after year and is amazing quality. And I just feel, very chic in it, I would say. What's the cost per wear? Very little. <laughs> I haven't worked that out. I probably could. I think, I mean, gosh, probably a fiver a wear at the moment, but it'll be a lot less in a few years. <laughs> Let's go down the handbag route. Yeah, of course. What are the brands that are investment pieces and what are not? Or is there such a thing as an investment handbag? I think we need to define investment, um, but I think there are certainly handbags that you can buy that are more likely to go up in value than down. So you can look at kind of your classic handbags, which are, but the way I would define a classic would be that it's produced year after year after year. Mm -hmm. And actually, if something is produced year after year and they go up in value, then you know that if you buy it, say, for example, at the moment, a classic flat over 8,000, 8,500, 8, et cetera. If you buy it at 8,500 today in five years time, that might be 10,500 to buy a new one. So you kind of feel a little bit safer, although it's a very big investment to start with, um, a little bit safer buying those and, and the more entry level potentially look at Louis Vuitton. Um, so they do kind of never full speedies. They've done them for years and years and years. And actually, um, because they keep producing them, they're very good investments. And then you look at your more trend led pieces. So anything that's a trend, you look at potentially over the last few years, the micro bag trend. You have to look at it and think, the way I always price a handbag is, is it practical first and foremost? And that goes for, is it too small to even get a lipstick or a card in? Or is it so big that actually I could get five other handbags in it? And if it's kind of one extreme or the other, actually that doesn't have much value in the long run because that is a trend item because it's not practical for someone to wear for another 10 years. Um, is it a good color? You know, if you're buying a white handbag, we have to be realistic and think you're not going to get a huge amount of wear. That's not a daily use handbag. Or I disagree. I really, you wear white every day, do you? I don't wear it every day, but I do have several white bags Yeah, and they're my most worn pieces. Okay. It's actually more practical to wear it in the winter than it is in the summer because of sun cream. Okay. But um, no, I'm a, I, you I like love a white bag. A white bag. Okay. Yeah. In terms of its resale though, it won't, it won't resell for as much as a black bag just because of the demand. Mm. There's a higher demand for, for black basically. Mm. So black and brown. So brown, when I say brown, it's a tan, not a chocolate brown. There's just certain colors that 
that really retain value and certain fabrics as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So for example, um, obviously leather is very hot, is is, retains its value very well in terms of the Chanel bag, the caviar leather um, would would hold, it's most in demand at the moment for us. Um, And then of course, hardwares as well, depending on if silver or gold is trending. Mm. So it's just super fascinating um, choosing what to buy, what will, have a good resale. Mm. Uh, what else has a good resale value that's not a handbag? Mm-hmm. What are the next sort of items in, in line? Chanel Bali Flats have a very good resale. They are incredibly expensive now, at least 800 to a thousand pounds to buy Chanel Bali Flats. And they're very popular as long as you kind of keep them relatively well. Uh, shoes are hard to keep well though. Uh, as I say, kind of classic coats, so Max Mara coats, Burberry trench coats, they they hold their value very well. Probably accessories, so belts, scarves, things like that, that, that generally would fit other people. And they stand the test of time. Yeah. And, classic know, items, of, essentially. Yeah. If you love fashion, mm-hmm. you'd love to have new pieces. But now you're going down the route of, well, I don't want to be A, spending too much money, or I don't really want to be buying fast fashion. I want something that is maybe more classic or more interesting, more unique. What advice would you give the shopper of how to shop for those items? To shop pre-owned, start with a list, start with Pinterest, gather your thoughts and your ideas into a board because... For anything like me, you'll see something and you love it. And then actually one month later, you're like, oh gosh, you know? So I think just gather your thoughts and uh, be diligent and intentional about the pieces that you want to buy. Decide if you want a capsule wardrobe, more trend-led wardrobe, whatever whatever you, you're trying to build. Just kind of get your ideas down. And then saved search. I love a saved search. I've got saved search in so many different websites that are just pinging me all the time. So I'm not having to constantly search for items. Uh, they're coming to me, which is great. And then also find yourself a personal shopper um, if you don't have much time. So that's one of the things that we offer at Sign of the Times because actually pre-owned does take time and you are waiting for pieces and actually to uh, ha- come into a store and have someone have picked already for you from from that store is is amazing and it means that you can be sustainable you can find pieces for incredible value and you also find really original items but you don't have to do all the hunting so if you're time poor uh but very fashion uh, fashion loving then that's a really nice option mm, that is a very good idea because it's very it's very time consuming shopping in the first place. I mean, I know women used to be much more into shopping. I certainly don't have time for no. it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I just want what I want when I want it. Exactly. <laughs> so having some support or someone who knows your taste and maybe can make recommendations, mm-hmm. that's super helpful mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Take me back in time. So, you know, talking about your own experience, like why did you want to go and start a business in pre-loved you know secondhand resale market I think it was born from that store at the end of my road you know I I saw I saw the economic opportunity Mm. I saw the need um and I just fell in love with it to be honest and I'd had a lot of outside influence so um many of my family own their own businesses. So it wasn't an unnatural step. In fact, it felt more natural than going for it for a job interview. In fact, at that age, I was so introverted. The idea of going for a job interview was a lot more scary than starting my own business. So really? yes. What, what so, is that? You know, it just seemed like an easy option. <laughs> but you, you know, at that age, I was, I was very young. You, you're naive, you have no idea. You didn't even seem like a risk, to be honest. I was very lucky I lived at home still. So it was kind of the perfect opportunity I think the the longer you spend in a job, the harder it is, and the higher the salary you're on, the harder it is to step away for, from the kind of comfort of that. So mm. I was lucky in that I started young, I think. So thinking about starting a business and thinking that it's easier than going for a job interview, <laughs> what were your expectations of starting a business? <laughs> I think I was just, I was young and naive probably, but actually um, so glad I did it. I think a lot of people have 
this expectation that starting a business is so difficult mm. and that's why thinking of you having the complete reverse mm. it i think that's really really interesting mm. how your perceptions <laughs> dictate what you think you're capable of or not because yeah, for most people they would think starting a business is impossible i don't even know where to start mm. as opposed to well let's just get a job and a regular paycheck so no oh, i think that's super <laughs> super interesting thank you is it what you expected it to be Gosh, uh, I think it's full of unexpected events, isn't it? Running a business, there is no day, there is no normal, is there? It's up, it's higher highs and lower lows, I would say, and a complete roller coaster. But I do love it. <laughs> Running a business is not for the faint-hearted, mm. and things ultimately don't always go the way that you have planned. What's the one failure or? mistake that had you not have made it you wouldn't be where you are now oh gosh um if you're not failing i think there's a very famous business that i probably won't name but they say that if if you're not failing at 50 percent of your goals you're not setting high enough goals so actually that is how I run my business and I fail quite a lot at achieving what I want to achieve because I do set very big growth targets. I do set, I do have a very high bar for myself and I fail. I'm, I don't enjoy failure at all. I, I really dislike it and I feel very uncomfortable with it. Um, but actually I think trying to take it as a, as a growth learning and a growth opportunity and trying not, well, ensuring that you don't fail at the same thing twice because actually uh, it's not really about, in my opinion, it's not about trying to avoid failure. It's actually accepting that things will go wrong and it's more about how you then handle that situation and how you learn and grow from it and how you improve the business because of it. Mm. So you actually factor in failure into your business? I guess, I mean, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, certainly in my numbers I do, yeah. Mm. No, I, I think that's a fantastic approach because, mm. well, it's going to happen. So you might as well embrace it. Mm. So let's make sure that everything is set up in a way to achieve very ambitious targets, knowing that, you know, not everything is going to go to plan, not mm. everything is going to go perfect, and that you know that you are striving for as high as you can because mm. things don't go to plan or things, yeah. you know, don't work out. Um I use the analogy of, you know, when I was used to be rock climbing, saying if you're not falling, then you're not trying hard enough. Exactly. So it's basically the same thing. Mm. Mm. What have you learned from making mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, resilience, for sure. Uh, the need for uh, to surround yourself with wise people and to try and approach people that have been there and done that before for advice and also to throw tennis balls before you throw cannonballs <laughs> so try small stuff small stuff test 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 and then when you find something that works go big what have you tested and then went big on mm. um i think sort of some some stuff around kind of our social media growth so when I first acquired the business, end of 2019, 2020, we had 7,000 followers. And now we've got 110,000 followers. And we tested loads and loads of different things to see what would work. And then when we found some things that worked for us, we then doubled down on those and went quite big. And it's just, you know, you can spend a lot of money trying to grow a social media following or trying to grow a customer base and to find certain things uh, that you that that work. Um, on a small scale and then putting a lot more investment into them has worked reasonably well for us. Mm. What has been the biggest area of growth for you? Is it through investing into social media? It's very hard to put a finger on it when you're growing a business because you're investing in lots of different things and, and it's hard to say for sure that that is the thing that has transformed our business. But certainly, of course, social media is such an empowering tool. It, it enables you to reach an audience far greater than a traditional older business. You know, your shop front is now worldwide rather than just on Chelsea High Street. So yeah, it's been absolutely game changing, I would mm -hmm. say. Looking back now, learning what you've learned about the business, about yourself, what do you wish you'd known sooner? Um... I think there is 
there's a comfort in the passing of time in a funny sort of way. And I wish my future self would teach my current self this because I still feel the same. But every day I feel an anxiety like a, a that just propels me forward and it's a constant state of I must do more I must do more and actually potentially if I look back I wouldn't have predicted the steps the step changes in the business that I have been lucky enough to have there's a bit of luck there's a bit of other stuff probably as well in there and I think it's kind of projecting that forward whilst you you look at your numbers and you think yeah we can do that we can do that but it's not accounting for those those opportunities that sometimes come up that you hadn't predicted or the people that come into your path that open doors and it's kind of those those unknowns in a positive way um that actually are fantastic and i i couldn't have predicted that kind of looking back mm. and, I, and i wish i'd had a more confidence in in that I suppose rather than a kind of anxious achievement desire <laughs> so I think there's there's this tendency to want to control every single mm-hmm. element mm-hmm. and when it goes right okay great you feel very justified that you've made the right decisions but what you're saying is having a little bit of flex and allowing other things to come in good and bad mm you invite things that you would have never predicted Mm -hmm. that are incredibly positive. Mm. And that is, it's almost like harnessing that power of letting unpredictable things come in that can massively change that. Yeah, I think I'm so with you on that because I feel like that's something that I'm trying to embrace myself and it's terrifying. Mm. It's so hard to let go, especially when you're used to having a lot of control or making things go the way you want them to go and yeah like letting some of that go is incredibly difficult so I'm really pleased that you're saying that that has worked in your favor in the past I think that's a really good lesson for other entrepreneurs what does leadership mean to you um I think for me leadership is actually I consider it as almost a serving so I am serving the business, I'm serving my team, I'm serving my customers. Uh, So serving the business means that I'm running a business in a thoughtful, careful way. With my team, I'm setting a clear vision and I'm serving them by creating an environment in which they can achieve on that vision and excel both professionally and personally. And then for my customers, I'm serving them by creating a business and that fulfills all of what they want from pre-owned and more and goes over and above to to provide for them. Mm. Do you see yourself as a leader? No, (laughs) (laughs) I don't think so. Mm. Uh, Just a facilitator, potentially. So so if you were to name yourself a leader, why would you not see yourself as that? Like what connotations does it have for you? (laughs) I don't know. I guess I always think of a leader as sort of, a president or a prime minister or that sort of, I think quite often to be quite frank that there's a lot of incredible minds in the world. And to, to you think of, I don't know, Elon Musk or someone like that, that's just absolutely conquered the world and really changed it. I would say that they, that would be my definition of a leader. Right. So it has to be someone who is literally like a billionaire who is going to fly over and live on Mars and take everybody, well, maybe select you with him. That's like, that is the app. That's like the minimum requirement for being a leader. Seems quite extreme, doesn't it? I, well, I, it's, it's, it's a, it's a viewpoint. It's, mm. it's how you perceive it. Mm. And I guess for me, it's, you know looking up to people like that obviously it's going to become completely impossible yeah it's completely unobtainable really isn't it because how many people really reach that level of Mm -hmm. success and Mm -hmm. leadership Mm -hmm. and for me I try to find people who are very good role models Mm -hmm. in the here and now that Mm -hmm. don't have to be you know so successful because I think leadership is in all of us and it's everywhere and for women especially, we need more female leaders, role models. Yeah. And I guess that's my next question to you. Like, mm. who do you look up to? Like, mm. who 
if anyone, um, male or female, were your role models? Yeah, for sure. I think one that does spring to mind is Debbie Waskell, who uh, she started one of the first kind of prerequisites to Airbnb, which was a home swap marketplace, and then went on to create an incredible female network and private members club, the Albright, as well as being a mother and sort of an absolute boss. And someone like that, I think, is is incredibly inspirational. Um, And then I'm also really lucky enough to have incredible female founders and mentors that are invested in my business. And I also really look up to them, the way that they have mentored me and supported me and opened doors for me and really leaned in to to helping me progress the business. Mm. So it's kind of the ones that have gone out and achieved kind of the unobtainable, but also having those ones that are closer to home that are really there on a day to day. What have you learned from them? Oh, wow. Um, I what's the biggest really, okay let's just yeah. say what's the biggest business lesson that you've re- received from one of your mentors yeah I think the best and the most simplest business lesson that I've learned is just build a good business and actually it sounds completely ridiculous to say that <laughs> just but, do a good job <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know there is so much kind of good marketing out there at the moment so many kind of like shiny new objects and the power of social media can actually kind of mask what is going on behind and actually by building a good business with good margins profitability good growth good people just building a good business something like that will always have value and stand the test of time um so it helps me focus sometimes because there's a lot of noise out there in the in the market i would say so to actually focus on kind of just executing on doing a good job is 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 quite helpful for me Mm. i think focus is more important than time people say oh time is money you know most precious commodity you have mm, is time mm. actually time is completely subjective like you can be in flow and time feels like it's standing still yeah. or you can be extremely frustrated and it feels like every second takes a decade and focus is v- even more precious than that because it's so easy to be distracted in our day to day with social media, with, you know, extra pressures, you know, team coming to you. And in my opinion, focus is way, way more important. Yeah, so I agree. how do you stay focused? Like what, what tips and tricks and hacks do you have for us to? <laughs> okay, well, I'm trying something new today for the first time. So maybe I need to follow up and let you know how it goes. But um, we use Workplace. So some people use Slack, like workplaces are Slack. And I've actually said today I am off Workplace because I want to focus. So this is really singing to my heart right now. And actually, I'm not going to be in the day to day. I've got some really big stuff that I'm trying to move forward. And I don't want to be it flitting between email, workplace, um, trying to do my work and just that constant kind of flit between messages. Uh, So I think being really disciplined and turning off all notifications, even deleting apps, because sometimes you'll you'll notice, I even do it, my thumb goes onto it and I didn't even want to go onto it. So I think deleting apps and also unfortunately Saturday mornings (laughs) because no one's working and um, Saturdays are a wonderful day uh, to have a coffee, spend a couple of hours, get the list sorted, get the big stuff at the top and start with the big stuff. Mm. Um, because actually quite often the big stuff gets pushed to the bottom um, because it's easier to tick off the small things. And it's so great just taking stuff off. You can also do them <laughs> more into like the small minutes of the day, as opposed to having that uninterrupted couple of hours or maybe even three that Mm. you can just like get your head down and you know and focus yeah I mean I'll give you a good example of this last Friday I decided that I was going to go and look and see what tweaks I can make to my website (laughs) I sat down at four o'clock in the afternoon and this is a Friday night oh no (laughs) and I did not leave my computer I'm not even joking like I did not leave my computer for anything, for a glass of water, nothing <laughs> until 1 a.m. Oh my God. It did the entire thing. And all oh, well, that's good. Yeah. And on the one hand, I feel like, well, that's, it's not sustainable to do that kind mm. of work. 
every single day no. or every week or even every month mm. but there are sometimes moments where you get so focused on a thing that literally nothing interrupts you and you can yeah. do something that might take you like a month mm -hmm. done in one sitting and it feels so good I felt end. very good, but I also felt like I was hungover <laughs> yeah. the next three days because of yeah. the lack of sleep. And, but yeah, no, focus is, is, is precious. And mm -hmm. I think for founders, especially, you know, when you're, you're working weekends or you're working mm -hmm. nights mm -hmm. and it can overtake your life. And I know yeah. some founders mm -hmm. talk about, mm -hmm. well, I need to learn to have more balance. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think you have balance in your work? Is it something that you strive for? Or like, what's your, what's your take on yeah, this? Yeah, I do strive for it. I would say I'm the sort of person I cannot do anything by halves. So I can't just check a message and that's, I, I can see a message, I have to reply to it. So actually how I've managed to create a bit of balance in my life is throughout the week, I work very, very long hours and um sometimes I'll work on a Saturday morning but then I do not even pick up my phone on a Sunday i not even for personal not for anything and every single Sunday I have off my phone and then if I'm on holiday I'll check my emails maybe once every two or three days and I won't go into my workplace and it's just I think it's kind of finding that because also, if you have too much time away then you get anxious as well so it's just finding that balance I think um and I am very conscious that my husband is incredibly supportive of me, but actually I have a loyalty and a, and a, and to him I owe that I am with him, I'm present with him and that we have wonderful times together as well mm -hmm. uh, because he's so supportive of the journey that I'm on. So yeah, I'm very conscious and very mindful of, of trying to build in balance for sure. Is that something that you've always done or has it come to you? later on um i think as the business has grown and as more opportunities have come i find it e incredibly difficult now from but like it was it was easier before than it is now because now we have a big team the business is growing very fast and i want to work all the time and i have to stop myself because actually when i've tested working all the time it doesn't last very long mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know if you work a if, if you work a very long week hours wise and then you work a weekend and then you work another long week actually you start not enjoying it and I really, I'm very lucky in so much as I really enjoy what I do. And that has sustained me and given me the resilience in the bad times. So it's it's a marathon, not a sprint. So I try and set myself up for that. It's interesting you say that when you've, you've, you've experienced it, when you're working so hard after a while, you know, your energy starts to go, you mm. know, you get tired, you get like, you're not enjoying that anymore. Mm. And I think... I've definitely been down that <laughs> road and, you know, really got myself to a place where I felt really tired. I was like, why am I even doing this? Mm. And not because I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. It was just that my physical, biological body wasn't getting what it needs, which mm. is like sleep and time to reflect and time yeah. to just be. Because I think we're very frequently, we think that we're just like robots, like machines, still like the relic of the industrial age that we can just <laughs> maintain the same energy at every single step of the way and just work 24 hours. And that's just not the case. Mm. And I feel like when we're most vibrant and productive and creative and allow those amazing opportunities yeah. to come our way because we can then spot them exactly. as opposed to thinking, oh my God, yet another thing. Yeah, That's when we are rested and not overworked. Mm. I think um, there's times and places, isn't there? I mean, during, for example, during COVID, I just acquired a new business. We acquired it through um, a mix of debt and equity. And so uh, going into COVID, uh, had an omni-channel business, so large store, uh, two stores actually, and an online and a huge amount of debt over the business going in. It was incredibly stressful. And we went, at the time, I think there was only a team of 10, but we went down to a team of three. Um, and so the hours that I was, you know, pulling during that time that was already very stressful, it, it, it's not, it's not, something that you can keep going and doing that forever but actually the resilience that that breeds in you and builds in you is retained and then 
as you say, in lighter times, when you can take those moments, that's when you get those new ideas that pop into your head and you take a step back and you think, why am I doing this? Like there is such a bit more efficient way of doing it. You get to just take a breath, reflect, and actually it makes you more impactful. Mm. No, for sure. I interviewed the founder of Unplugged Mm. after I went on the retreat. It was a present from my husband for Christmas and it was three days in the middle of nowhere and you know, I had my internet, but I I chose to turn it off and I wasn't on my apps or anything. But when you were saying how like even your finger just goes, I've caught myself because I was like, I'm going to just, you know, take up. I said to myself, I need to know how to manage technology. So I will (laughs) use WhatsApp to message my my family and call them. And that's it, like Mm -hmm. nothing else. And as soon as I left the WhatsApp, like my fingers went immediately onto this other, you know, app. So I was like, oh my God, how much we are conditioned and addicted and programmed (laughs) because we just do this over and over and over. And after that retreat, I was literally, I was making myself, I was by myself, dancing in this tiny little kitchen, looking out onto the rainy, like, you know, field. And saying how happy I am and how everything was just like a veil had lifted. Mm. And all of a sudden you can think clearly. Yeah. You feel excited about something. You feel like this is where I need to go and what I need to focus on. As opposed to just spreading your energy across lots of different things that feel like they need to be done. Yeah. But maybe not strictly necessary. So yeah, that time for reflection is so key. Mm, Mm. Could not agree more. How do you, do you do anything specific? I mean, you said you, you know, Sundays you, you, you turn off your phone. Do you do anything specific to try to retain that, um, to spend more time like reflecting or being more proactive about it? Uh, I do. I mean, I practice yoga, which I think is quite good Mm -hmm. for just you can't actually use your phone during yoga. Yes. <laughs> you know, I used to go to the gym and I could use my phone at the gym. Uh, so I used to just work through all my gym sessions, but now I cannot because I have to leave my phone. So just trying to enforce pockets of quiet throughout the week. But I wouldn't say I've really nailed that if I'm being totally honest. Mm. <laughs> no. Work in progress. It, work in progress. It's amazing how we know what we need to do. Yeah. And yet the hardest thing is to do it. Mm. Yeah. I think there's a pressure as well, isn't there? to to respond quickly to things and especially if you're trying to move things forward so there is that constant you know pull for for work so oh this opportunity's come in or can you come back to me on that or I'm trying to get this live or whatever you're trying to move forward there is that urgency to it especially in a startup when every single second feels like it counts Mm. yeah and I think you get so used to working in that pace where Mm. everything becomes urgent and Mm. I think that when you get into that stage then you know something's not right Mm. because everything cannot be urgent and if it is then (laughs) something's not working yes whether it's that you're taking on too many things whether you don't have enough team maybe you need to pull more resource into hiring someone Mm. or you need to go out and get extra investment or you know your sales so you like there is something in the business that you might possibly be even avoiding yeah. dealing with because that's the thing that's going to make the most impact mm. and resolve that for you um but you know living constantly on urgency it's it's definitely not sustainable no. when everything is falling apart or things don't go to plan or it's really difficult and challenging and you don't know what you know the next thing is how do you stay motivated mm. I think I do have a natural resilience. I grew up having to have that. I competed in sport to a high level. Which sport? um, In dressage. Right. Yeah. So that is hard graft. It's long hours. I used to drive um, two hours to uh, train my horse at uni, two hours back when all of my friends were out partying and certainly growing up, you know, I I did that since I was five. It's out in the cold. It's out in the wet. There's no excuses. You just have to get on with it, to be honest. Is it something that you yourself wanted to do? Yes. I loved it. Oh, sorry. As in, (laughs) I didn't compete from the age of five, but I was riding from the age of five. Um, and I think that just bred in me a kind of if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. If I know something has to be done, it gets done. And 
that kind of inner resilience, I guess, has stayed with me to a certain degree. But then also I surround myself with incredible people that when I don't have the energy myself, that they kind of give me the energy to keep going as well. So the encouragement and the kind of reminding me why I'm doing it and the vision and all of those things. Um, so I think it's kind of a combination of of other people and then an inner determination in myself as well. Mm. That's amazing from that young age to want to to do something so specific and like to keep going and to, to stick with it. Yeah, so. so from five to 21. Wow. Do you still do some of that? I I don't simply because I honestly do not have the time. It is yeah. a very time intensive sport and mm. uh, you have to live in the country really to, to be able to compete at the level I was or yeah, yeah to have the facilities. Mm. That's mm. why you have such great posture. <laughs> oh, do I have great posture? <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know that. Yes, no, I so do. It was years of sit up. <laughs> yeah, I'm straight. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I used to love horses when I was a, as a kid, but mm. I probably wasn't quite loud enough to tell my parents to do that. And like living or growing up in London. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you have to be much closer to the stables. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Being resilient and doing challenging things. Yeah. Like what have you found really challenging as a founder? Like what has been the hardest thing for you? Sure. So I think the time during COVID was incredibly challenging uh, for me, very formative, I would say. Mm. And then also fundraising kind of coming out of COVID as well. So it was an incredibly, the time that I was fundraising, there was an incredibly difficult economic climate and I didn't have EIS or SEIS. And actually uh, I'm, that's why I kind of talked about the importance of having a good business because now if I have founders coming to me saying I'm trying to fundraise, et cetera, et cetera, I said, well, first of all, focus on building a good business and focus on you trying to make money yourself and proving it before going out to ask investors. Because the one thing that enabled me to cut through with my investment was the business that we had. We were profitable, which at the time was a very unusual thing in the market. And we were growing and it's it's kind of proving it yourself on your own money, on your own time before going then to others and asking them to put money into you. Mm. And talk me through about fundraising. Like, mm -hmm. What was the experience like for you? Because in fact, I'm not going to make it a leading question, but like, talk me through your experience of fundraising. Sure. I think there are obviously some depressing stats out there, aren't there? I think it's 3% of VC backed businesses. Are under two. Under two. Okay. Under 2%. It's, it, that was the kind of statistics that I was having thrown at me mm -hmm. as well as, oh, you don't have SEIS or EIS. That's going to make it really challenging because it's not tax efficient. And there was a lot of negative speak, I would say. And I think it, it is challenging when you're going out and speaking to investors to kind of go in with that confidence when you've had a lot of negative rhetoric actually kind of in the background. Mm -hmm. So I think my my fundraising experience, I would say it was it was very formative as well because you go in and you speak to incredibly intelligent, incredible people that have potentially been there growing businesses and now are looking to kind of come back and reinvest. And for them to look at your business and actually say, wow, that is a good business was potentially the validation that I needed actually because until that point, I'd never ever had anyone else look at my business and say, wow, you've done a good job. Mm. And so in a weird sort of way, I found it quite validating. Um, it was of course very, it was relentless. And at times you feel, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, another meeting. And actually what I really want to be doing is running my business. Um, but it was, yeah, it was character building and gave me a lot more confidence. I would say, you know, standing up, presenting into a room of 20 people, having them really rip you apart in your numbers and standing up strong and, you know, all of those things, it, it builds, it builds confidence in my team and my business and myself, um, I would say. So were you surprised when you received, you know, good feedback that's saying, oh, actually, you know, this is, you know, when we're talking about feeling validated mm -hmm. or were you like, oh, okay, actually, yeah. Yeah. I think it's quite interesting because obviously I, 
I, whilst I'd done a round before, it was slightly different because it was in order to acquire the business. This was the first time I'd gone out to kind of, I guess, speak to a wider wider audience. Um, and all I know is my own business. So I don't know how that kind of stacks up in the market. So yeah, I guess it was a kind of nice validation actually. Mm. So what do you think made you successful in getting it thus far at that point? Gosh. Um, I think I think that's very difficult to define. It's many, many years, isn't it? It's many years of um, really understanding the market, kind of being thoughtful around decisions, sticking to your guns in terms of how you choose to spend money, being very thoughtful about the team that you hire. It's a whole mishmash of what makes a good business, I suppose. Mm. But I'm just trying to get under the skid of, you know, how you make decisions and like what's the priorities. Many businesses have this fantasy or this glamorized idea of if you're going out, you know, you're raising lots of money and then you can just do whatever you want and like, you know, and, you know, hiring the teams and spending all this money everywhere. Mm. Whereas actually what investors really are looking for is this ability, for A, to scale and B, you know, is this person actually going to make it? profitable at some mm, point mm. and if it's already profitable then the chances are that they can maintain that they just mm. need extra fuel to kind of get it to the next level so having a business in that stage as opposed to constantly running out of money and yeah. we need that it's a very different starting point when exactly. it comes to, with investors and uh, that puts you in a really really good place mm. so no really interesting so What's next for you? <laughs> oh gosh, the day job. <laughs> um, you know, I do have really big ambitions for the business. So, um, and we have just closed around. So we are doing a, a rebrand, which I'm very excited about. And we are also starting our take back service. So that's a white label service for retailers, luxury retailers, so they can offer resale without it actually impacting their own supply chain. So we've got a few exciting partnerships coming up in that regard. Um, and I think it is about finding new partnerships as well at the moment. So just um, opening our doors and speaking to lots of exciting um, other businesses mm. and kind of working really collaboratively. What's the ideal partnership for you? Mm. Like who would be the ideal partner? Mm. So I think uh, a, a multi-brand luxury retailer is is kind of the ones that we are, we are seeking at the moment, I would say. Mm. They, they're kind of best fitted. We are a multi-brand pre-owned and it's a really, really nice synergy. Hmm. You're going to hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> what seems impossible to you now? Oh God. But should you achieve it, it will change the course of your life and business. <laughs> <laughs> everything <laughs> no do you know what I think it's as I say time is incredible so uh this year we will um, have a quite an incredible landmark in so much as we will do in a month what we did in a year four years ago so the, four years ago you can't believe possibly that you'll get to that to that size now I try not to limit my dreams as to how how big we could possibly grow uh but I'd love to to say that I can't quite imagine doing in a month what we're going to do in a year this year but that's yeah <laughs> well I'll be keeping it it's it, it, a great answer thank you <laughs> <laughs> and I wish you all the success and um, in your business and just been wonderful to talk to you and you know get a little bit of a glimpse of your energy and your drive and being quite what's the word i'm looking for humble about it but uh no really lovely to have you on the show thank, thank you, you. Ontario. no thank you so much for having <laughs> me it's been an absolute pleasure and nice to take yeah. some time out yeah <laughs> amazing you. you've been listening to anatomy of a leader podcast I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>